next time when Dad did his magic, we're going for a day out in the car. Ox. Oxford. That's where we're going, near where your aunt lives. Granddad? Mm -hmm. Why do they make road signs so big? Well, because cars travel very fast, so they need big signs so that the drivers can read them from a long way off and make up their mind where they're going. Oh, no. What is it, Brenda? Listen. Can't you hear that noise? What noise? That knocking. Sounds like a puncture. Oh, that's what I think, too. Flat as a pancake. Does that mean we're not going to see Auntie? Well, not for a while, we're not. Can you manage on your own, Brenda? I'm not even going to try, Grandad. I'm going to run back to that garage just up there, see if I can get a mechanic to come and help. Can you look after the kids while I'm gone? <laughs> I'll come with you. No, no, Gary. I'll be much quicker on my own. No, I want to come. I wouldn't do that if I were you, Gary. You might miss out on something rather special. Does that mean? It's all right, Brenda. He's going to stay with me, aren't you, Daddy? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to stay with him. I'll be as quick as I can. Don't you worry about us. We'll be all right. How did we used to get about when Albert was a lad? Without a lorry or van or car, how did we visit our friends? What did we do when we moved house or wanted to catch a bus? If you want to know what happened then, close your eyes and follow us. Before the days of da 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 A pony, a pony, we've got a pony. Kimberly, look. And you've changed our clothes, we've changed our clothes, Kimberly. Yes, all right, Gary. Yes, well, that's because we're out and about today. We don't know who we're going to meet. People think we were very odd in our ordinary clothes. <laughs> Good morning. Granddad? No, just borrowed, along with the trap for the day. Has it got a name? Her name is Maggie. This is much better than those my car. It's a bit bumpy. That's because the road is bumpy. And the cart hasn't got rubber tyres like your mother's car has. <laughs> it's rather uncomfortable with metal tyres. But you don't get punctures. That's true. You don't. Where are we? There's a signpost up ahead. Let's look. It's a tiny signpost. Yes, well, it doesn't need to be any bigger. We're not travelling fast, so we don't have to read it from a long way off. Can you see what it says, Kibbley? It's an Oxford. Does that mean the same roads we were on before? It's a very narrow road. Morning, morning, morning. That's because there isn't much traffic. We're very lucky, you know, to have a pony and trap. Most of the people these days have to go on foot. Where are all the houses? They haven't been built yet. I'm glad you're not walking. I like this. Oh, you do, do you? Yeah, I think horses are much better than cars. They don't go as fast. Yeah, but they don't go wrong. Don't they? I think you may have spoken a little too soon. She doesn't sound right, does our Maggie? Oh, whoa, girl. Whoa, I thought so. She's lost a shoe. So what happens now? You'll have to hop out. 
Ah, good morning, Mrs. Morning. Fine morning. It is indeed. Could you tell me if there's a blacksmith around here? Yeah, you'll find one about a mile back down the road, just beyond the farm. Oh, that's lucky. Out you go. Why, where are we going? We're going to walk the pony to be shod. That means to get her a new shoe. Out you go, darling. That's it. Danny, go down the road a little way and see if you can see that shoe. What's it look like? Oh, I'll show you. That's it. An iron horseshoe. Like that. Now, you just go back along the road, only a little way. You're all right. There's no traffic about these days. Granddad, look! What? Look at those big horses. Those horses are huge. Shire horses, they're called. They pull the big carts. The big carts like lorries. That's right. So when you were a boy, horses yeah. were a bit like engines. That's exactly what they were like. And have you seen what's on the wagon? All those pots and pans. And tables and chairs. It's a removal van. That's exactly what it is. Come on, Maggie, to the blacksmith. Before the days of motor cars, when Albert was a man, instead of an engine we had a horse, they travelled more slowly than Horses pulled our carriage, a pony pulled our trap. They never went past along the road, unless you gave them a tap. Unless you gave them a tap. It's the wagon again, Grandad. They must be moving into that house. Why have those horses got bags over their heads? Those are nose bags. The horses eat their food out of those when they're on the road. Rather like putting petrol into a car. Grandad. What? That horse has done a poo. <laughs> That's all right. They're used to that sort of thing around here. Look. Does someone come out of the house to shovel it up? What's he going to do with it? Put it on his garden, make his plants grow. They must all have good gardens with all these horses. Better than petrol fumes, eh? Does it smell better? <laughs> come on, Maggie. Come on, dear. Oh, Maggie. Kimberly. You going to hold the pony while I go and see the blacksmith? Right. Come on, go. Oh, good morning, Jim. Morning. I'm afraid our pony's lost its shoe. I wonder if you could put this on just for now. You'll have to wait a minute. That's a big shoe. That'll be for a shy horse. Like those horses you saw outside pulling the furniture wagon. What are you doing? I'm working the bellows. What for? Well, it blows air into the fire. It makes it burn hotter. It's too hot already, not cold out today, you know. No, the fire's not for us. It's for working the iron. What's that mean? Well, the iron's very hard, right? But if you heat it very hot in the fire, it starts to soften. See, then my dad can beat it into shape. He really does put it on the fire. Mr. Pony ready? Yes. Bring him in. Come back, Maggie, Maggie, come back. <laughs> Maggie taking you for a walk. She keeps wanting to go over here. <laughs> she wants the grey, she wants to eat more of that grass. Come on, Maggie. Is it all right later? Later. The blacksmith wants to shoe her now. Come on, Maggie. You can have your feed when we've done with it. Come on, please. It's all right, it doesn't matter. It's a horrible smell. Yes, but that's the hoof burning. But it's all right. Maggie doesn't mind a bit. Come outside if you don't want to watch. What do they do it? To make the shoe sit more comfortably on the foot. 
It's just got to let it cool down before he nails it on. Nails? Shh, it doesn't hurt, honest. See, horses' hooves are a bit like our fingernails. See, there's no feelings in the end of your nails, is there? What's that? Oh, that's something special. You are in luck. No, I didn't. Cars were invented before I was born. There aren't many of them about now. You know, only rich people can afford cars. It doesn't go very far. No, yeah, well, the early ones didn't. I don't suppose you see many of those around here? Oh, no, thank goodness. But they'd better watch out if they're going through the village. Because down in the village, the boys throw stones at the motor cars. Noisy, nasty, smelly things. Do you think they'll catch on? <clears throat> Can't see it myself. Uh, he's almost finished now. Are we going back to the track? I think your mum might just about have got the car fixed. Oh, but I don't want to go back. I want to stay here forever. It's time to go back. How much do I owe you? And that will be sixpence, sir. Uh, that'll be five pounds, love. Thanks ever so much. Oh, that's not fair. We're back already. We didn't even have a song. Well, we can have one now. All right, Brenda? Yeah, yeah, hop in. I'm just going to run this chap back to the garage. <laughs> Horses pulled our carriages and ponies pulled our traps. Instead of petrol, we fed them oats, gave them water and brushed their coats. When they needed shoes on their feet, to the blacksmith we would go. He heated the iron and hammered it to make the shoe a perfect fit. And then we clicked off down the street and didn't travel fast Cause everything was slower then Before the days of cars <laughs> Yeah, they sound like they're having a good time They always do Don't know what I'd do without my granddad Things he tells them He keeps them happy for hours <laughs> See you soon Come back next week. Telling. Tell me. If I tell you, I might lose my magic. You're teasing. He's teasing. Come on, it's half past seven, upstairs and into the bar. Oh, but I want to watch the end of the programme. You'll be lucky. Gary, you are not watching that programme to the end, and that's all there is to it. But I don't want a bar. Now, don't start that again. I hate bar. Now, come on, do as you're told. Oh, when I was your age, it was a treat to have a bath. Why? Oh, well, we didn't have a bathroom in our house. Tell you what, how about I giving you a bath tonight and telling you a story? One of your magic stories? Yes, did you say yes? He's going to do some more magic. Oh, hang on, Gary. Not upstairs. You're not having your bath upstairs tonight. Why? Where are we having a bath? Where do you think? You 
want to know what life was like when Albert was a lad. We had no electricity. So what did we do without TV? What if you wanted a bath at night when there was no bathroom? What if we needed the loo in the night? How did we read without good light? If you really want to know, then you must close your eyes. Great Grandpa takes you back in time. You're in for a big surprise. You've come then. Look, Liza, Kimberly and Gary are here. Hello. 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 It's dark. Why is it so dark? So it is. You're quite right, Gary. I was so comfortable sitting here, I didn't even notice. Get me a spill, Kimberly. There's a good girl, and I'll light the gas lamp. What's she talking about? I'll show you. This is a spill. Go and light it at the fire, Kimberly. Now be careful. Don't they even have matches? Of course we do. But we don't use matches once the fire's alight. Waste of money. Thank you, my love. Now I'll light it. We don't want you breaking the mantle. What's a mantle? It's that little bit of gauze. You watch it glow when she lights the gas. There. That's better. Not much. Gary. Why have you come anyway? You come for bath tonight? Um, yes, yes, he, he has. Of course he has. I still have a bath on a Friday. All nice little boys and girls have a bath on a Friday. Don't you have a bath all the other nights? Of course not. You see, it's not easy having a bath like this. The tub has to be filled by hand with jugs. Get us some fresh hot water, will you, Gary? You know where to get hot water, Gary? Yeah, of course I do. There's only one tap and it's cold water. <laughs> In other words, you don't know where to get the hot water. I'll show you where to get the hot water. You just come over here. Now, you see that tap? Yeah. That's where you get the hot water. Oh, no! <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. There you are. Where do you want this? In there. Careful we don't burn out yet. And you best put some more on the heat. By the time you lot are washed, what was going to be cold? They all use the same water. Yes, well. It's quite a performance filling the bath. You can't have it fresh for everyone. Two lots of water my mother used to have, but eight of us. Now you sit by the fire, Jack, and let Kimberly and Gary have their bath. Do we really have to have a bath, Grandad? Of course, it's all part of the magic. But before you get undressed, you'd better take a trip out to the privy, otherwise you'll catch a cold after your bath. What's the privy? It's what you call the loo. And it's outside in the yard. Is there a loo in the house? Of course not. We're not rich folk. Come on, I'll show you. Let's light a candle for them, Bert. Mm -hmm. It's dark out there. Light this spill for me, will you, Kimberly? Okay. Shall I light it? Yes, please. That's it. Now, you sure you're ready for this? Right, who's going first? Me, me, me! <laughs> All right, off you go. Three, it's freezing out here. Oh, yes, it's freezing. Wet nights are the worst. Go on, that door there. Yes? There isn't any loo paper. Oh, yes, there is. You'll find some newspaper on a string. Grandad? 
Yes? The candle's gone out. Oh, well, never mind. Hurry up. You'll be all right. I don't like it here. Shut that door, Albert. The girl will catch her death of cold. How are you enjoying yourself? I like it. It's fun. I like to have a bath by the fire every night. The only time we had a bath when Albert was a lad was by the fire on a Friday night in the tub by the firelight and then we put our nightshirts on before we went to bed we sat by the fire and dried our hair watched the coals and saw pictures there the only time we had a Sorry, it won't hold the way. You want it to look nice, don't you? And you brush it out for church on Sunday. There, that's you done. Now you two girls sit by the fire and get those plaits dry. We don't want you going up to bed with wet hair. You'll catch cold. What's Jack doing? He's making stills. Mm. What are you doing? I'm knitting socks, darling. My mum buys our socks. Oh, I couldn't afford to do that. I knit socks for all the family. Our Liza helps, except just now she's busy with the rug. You want to see it? You're making a rug? Of course we are. We make a new rug every year, just in time for Christmas. Show them, Liza. That's nice. You know how to do it? Not now, Liza. It's time to go up the wooden hill to bed. It's like we really winking. <laughs> They only come up here to go to bed. But what if one of them's ill? Oh, if one of them's ill, that's different. Then they might light a fire. Albert, you've kept them talking long enough. No more chattering. Come on, children, into bed with you. But there's only one bed. Yes, that's right. But we've had six in this bed before now. Look, you and Jack go at this end with your feet facing that way. Liza and Kimberly lie this way. Top to tail, we call it. I've got my own bed at home, you know. Nobody I know has a bed to themselves. That's right. Unless they're an only child or very rich. Grandad. What? What happens if I need to go to the loo in the night? Do I have to go all the way outside? Of course not. You use a gazanda. What's that? The chamber pot. And do you know why she calls it a gazanda? No. Because. It goes under the bed. <laughs> Jack's asleep already. And you should be asleep too, so snuggle down. Yes, but before you do, say goodbye and thank you to Eliza and Jack and Mrs. Deacon, because you'll be gone long before they're awake. Goodbye. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. It's been a pleasure, my dears. Good night. Sweet dreams. So now you know what life was like when Albert was a lad. We had no electricity, but we plenty to do with our TV. Socks to knit and rugs to make. They didn't bath that much. And when they wanted the loo in the night, they used the potty.
children? Granddad? Granddad? That's right, it did. You see, sometime after Mr. and Mrs. Deakin were dead and gone, some other person that lived in your house turned the bedroom into a bathroom. Don't tell me you still haven't finished the story. We have now. Oh, no. Yes, we have. I hope so, because it's time you were asleep. Say goodnight to Granddad. Night, Granddad. No, darling. Night, Granddad. No, darling. Thanks for telling us all about the past. All I told you about was what life was like when I was a lad. The past goes back and back and back. My grandfather told me things that his grandfather told him. Can you tell us things that your grandfather told you? Not tonight. Not tonight. Another time, perhaps. Let's hope so. Good night. Chadwick, I'm the one with the magic granddad. He's magic because he knows how to go back in time. Once, he took us back to see when our house had just been built and we met the people who lived in it then. And just the other day, we did something even more exciting. What lies ahead, Tony? Can you remember? Well, Look, granddad. Hmm? Oh, that's nice, Kimberly. That, that's very nice. Let me see. What is it? It's Rapunzel, the princess who's shut up in a tower. What's she doing? She's letting down her hair so the prince can climb up. That's stupid. No, it's not. Yes, it is. He can climb up her hair. Yes, he could. He did, didn't he, Grandad? That's what the story says. It's a stupid story, then. You're stupid if you believe it. I'm not! Now, come now. Stop that. You'll get me in trouble with your mum if you fight like that. Well, I'm not stupid. Oh, come now. How would you like me to tell you a true story of a, a princess who was shut up in a tower? Yes, please! Okay. All right. Huh? Her name was Princess Elizabeth, and she lived 400 years ago. And she was locked up in the Tower of London. Why was she locked up in the Tower of London? Well, there were lots of reasons. One reason was that she didn't get on with her elder sister, Mary. And as Sister Mary was Queen of England, that meant she was boss of the whole of the country. So when she thought her little sister wasn't behaving herself, she had her shut up in the Tower. Wish I could do that with Gary. <laughs> You're making this up. Oh, no, I'm not. This is history. It really happened. Look. There's a picture of Princess Elizabeth. It was painted by someone who lived then. Did she really wear clothes like that? Yes. But I expect these were for best. Granddad. Yes, Kimberly? Could we go back in time and meet her? Oh, I don't know about that, Kimberly. It was a long time ago, 400 years. I've never been that far back in time. Oh, please. No, I wouldn't know how to go back that far. Anyway, suppose we couldn't get home again. We'd be locked in the tower with the Princess Elizabeth. No, we wouldn't. You get us back here. You think so? I know you would. No. We can try. But for my magic to work, we have to have a song. 
Any song? No, it has to be a song that people would have known then. I know. What? It might work. I'm not promising anything. What are you going to sing? It's called Green Sleeves. And some people think that it was written by Elizabeth's father, King Henry VIII. Sing the song, Grandad. Very well. Come in close and close your eyes. Oh, we're going to meet a real princess. Yeah, we hope so. Green sleeves was all my joy. Green sleeves was my delight. Green sleeves was my heart of gold. And who but my lady The Princess Elizabeth, sir. The Princess Elizabeth, Grandad. We've done it. Blow me down, so we have. Grandad, look what that boy's wearing. Yellow stockings and funny knickers. Shh, shh, shh. Don't be so rude. May I go give them to my lady, sir? Yes? It's Ned, ma'am. My little Ned, come in. Can we go too? Yes, quick. But what if the guard sees us? He won't. If I don't want people to see us, they don't. That's part of the magic. It's the lady in the painting. For you, my lady. My sweetest little Ned. Do flowers still bloom outside? Yes, ma'am. The sun is shining and the grass is all flowers. And you bring some to me? My mother said it might cheer you. It does. It brings a little sunshine into this dark room. I thank you, Ned. I cannot stay. They will not let me. I know. But I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Never will I forget your kindness. I'll try and come again tomorrow. If you can. Only if you can. It's not surprising, really. She's very lonely and frightened. Who are you? Oh, don't you worry about us, ma'am. We can't hurt you. We're from the future. My name is Albert, and this is my great-granddaughter, Kimberly. Curtsy, Kimberly. Say hello to the princess. You should call her my lady princess. My lady princess. Has no one ever taught you to curtsy properly, child? Um, no. Never curtsied to anyone before. Then it is high time you were taught. Come here. The back straight, and then deeply into the curtsy. And there you wait until I tell you to rise. Yes, miss. Ma'am. Um, yes, ma'am. So, pray show me. It will have to do. But if you are to be at court, child, then you must practice. And you, lad. This is my great-grandson, Gary. And you must bow, Gary, to the princess. Like you saw Ned do just now. for you to kiss her hand. Why? Because that's what people did. But I want to. That's it's stupid. Go on, Gary. Why are you here? Well, Grandad was telling us all about you, and I said I wanted to go back in time and meet you to see what it was really like. So now you see, a princess of England a king's daughter, imprisoned like a traitor in the Tower of London. 
I am kept from all company. I don't understand what she's talking about, Grandad. She says she's not allowed to speak to anyone. Why not? For fear I plot with them against my lady sister, the Queen. Were you plotting to make yourself Queen, Mum? Certainly not. My sister is the rightful Queen. Grandad told us you don't like your sister. No, he didn't, Gary. He said that she and Mary didn't get on. What mean you by that, sir? I merely meant, ma'am, that you and your sister, well, things are difficult between you. Which isn't surprising, really, when so many people like you more than they like Mary and want you to be queen instead of her. Be careful, sir. These are dangerous words. Men have lost their heads for saying less. What does she mean? Lost their heads? How could they lose their heads? She means had their heads chopped off with an axe. Really? You mean they were killed? Yes, that's what happened to people who plotted against the Queen. Who knocks? Sir John Gage, my lady. It's the keeper of the tower, my jailer. Quick, hide behind the tapestry. No, but it's all right. They can't see the church. Tis Robin Hyde. Pray enter, Sir John. I'm told you wish to speak to me, Your Grace. Yes, I wish to write to my sister, the Queen. Madam, I've told you before, that cannot be. My orders are that you may write Her Majesty no more letters. Why not, sir? Madam, I do not know. I only obey orders. And are your orders that I should have nothing to do? I am tired of sitting alone in this room, sir. You are allowed to walk by the walls outside. A few paces up and down. I am used to hunt and ride my horse the whole long day, sir. Here I must live caged like a bird. Even the shutters must remain closed. That posy, madam, where did it come from? It was the gift of a child. What child? My orders are that no man, no woman, no child comes here. Pray, give it me. A child's gift. You would take even that from me. Let me see those flowers. Be careful, sir. You will break them. I want to know who this boy is. Pray, why? He is but a baby, sir. The son of one of your own officers. What harm can there be in an infant's flowers? A message may be hidden in an infant's flowers. There is no message, I swear. We shall see. This room will be searched, madam, thoroughly. You will find nothing unless you put it there. Grandad, what's going to happen? You must leave at once. If they find you, it will be my death. They are only looking for an excuse to murder me. Do not worry, we're going. Oh, the song, I hope it works. Kimberly, Gary, you're going to have to help me. My lady, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you for having us. Yes, be gone, I pray. We're going. Are you ready? One, two, three. Green sleeves was all my joy. Green sleeves was my delight. Green sleeves with my heart of gold. And who but my lady? Green sleeves. Oh, oh, we made it. Thank heaven for that. What happened to her? I hope the guards didn't find anything in her room. No, they didn't. Did she ever get out of the tower? Oh, yes. She got out all right. In fact, a few years later, when her sister Mary died, she became Queen Elizabeth I. And everyone was very happy because they liked her. But they were scared of her, too. She didn't stand any nonsense. She was a very strong queen. Look, here's a picture of her when she was queen. Wow, look at her dress there. <laughs> Granddad, mm -hmm. what is the difference between history and a story? A story is something that's made up. History is something that really happened. But how do we know? Because of the painting, silly. Yes, that's one way, but there are lots of other ways. We know the story of the little boy and the flowers and how he wasn't allowed to see Elizabeth again because someone who was there at the time wrote it down. So it really happened? It really happened. <laughs> <laughs> he 
Elizabeth was in the tower. A little boy came visiting. He brought her flowers which gave her joy. But the jailer said, never again, boy. <laughs> So she has a guide dog to help her. He's called Punch. Punch is ever so clever. He helps Auntie Pat to cross the road, and if there's things in the way on the pavement, he helps her get round them. Magic Grandad said we could all have our tea in a pizza restaurant. Dogs aren't allowed in restaurants, unless they're guide dogs. Come along, Gay. Sit up in your place, there's a good chap. Excuse me, could we have the braille menu? What are you going to have, Kimberly? Um, I'm going to have a... Um, cheese and tomato pizza and a Coca-Cola. I'm going to have a Four Seasons pizza and um, a lemonade. Here you are. Oh, thank you very much, thank you. What are you going to have, Auntie Pat? Oh, hang on a minute, I haven't had time to read this menu yet. Uh, what shall I have? I haven't had for a while. Oh, here's something. Mozzarella and tomato salad. How does she know that? She's reading the menu, aren't you, Pat? Yeah. <laughs> How can she read if she can't see? Why don't you ask your auntie? Gary, love, I read with my fingers and I touch the words. Touch the words? But there aren't any words. I can't see any. Yes, there are. Why don't you have a try? Give me a finger. See? There's lots of little bumps. Yes, and each group of little bumps makes a letter. And those little bumps are a special language for blind people. And they were invented by a blind person. A young French boy called Louis Braille. Did he live a long time ago, Grandad? Yes, Kimberly, he did. Ah, oh, can we go... No, we can't. We're going to have our tea. Now, does everyone know what they're going to have? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. That evening, before we went to bed, Grandad read to us from a book about Louis Braille. It all started in a very sad way. Because Louis wasn't born blind, he became blind as a result of a very nasty accident when he was three years old. All because he didn't do as he was told. Sounds like you, Gary. Shut up. Now, come now, do you want to hear this story or not? Yes, go on about Louis Braille, Grandad. Well, he lived in a little village in France where his father made saddles and bridles for all the horses in the village. And Louis used to come into his workshop and watch. Now, the workshop was full of knives and special tools for making holes in leather. And because they were very sharp, Louis's father had told him he must never, ever touch them. But one day, when his father wasn't looking, he picked up a very sharp tool called an awl and tried to poke it through the leather, just like his father did. But the awl slipped and went straight into his eye. Did it bleed? It did, but worse than that. He went blind. Oh, I'm glad we didn't go back in time. We wouldn't go back and meet him at this point in the story. No, no, you see, Louis Braille wasn't famous because he had an accident and went blind. It was because he did something very, very clever that has helped blind people all over the world ever since. And he did it when he was just 15 years old when he was at a special school for blind children in Paris. Can we go back and see him then? Well, we can try. But what about Auntie Pat? Don't you worry. Trust me. OK. The only trouble is I'm not sure that my magic is strong enough. You see, Louis Braille lived in France, and I've never been abroad before. But if he lived in France, why don't he speak French? Yes, that's the difficulty. It means I'll have to do a bit of extra magic. But first, 
We need a French song. I know one, I know one. Do you? Yes, shall I sing it? Yes, please. Ready? Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, Tomez-vous, Tomez-vous, Sonnez les matines, Sonnez les matines, Ding, dang, dong, Ding, dang, dong. Lovely, well done. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. The only trouble is, if we go into the past talking French, they might think we understand French when we get there. So what should we do? What about some English words? We can't make up words for a song just like that. You can if you're a magic granddad. So, close your eyes and cross your fingers. And here we go. Louis Braille, Louis Braille, are you there? Are you there? Talk to us in English. Talk to us in English. Here we come. Boys, I must go and meet our visitors, Gabrielle. Can I leave you in charge of the class till my return? Yes, sir. That was brilliant, Grandad. We're here and we're talking English. Yes, the only trouble is uh, I don't know which of these lads is Louis Braille. <laughs> Hello, are you looking for me? We're looking for Louis Braille. Oh, that's me. You've come to see how we blind boys live, I believe. Yes. You're very welcome. Please ask anything you want. The rope? Why are we all holding on to it like that? Oh, that's because we've been outside the school for a walk in the park. But why do you have to hold on to a rope? Why don't you have guide dogs? Guide dogs? Louis won't know what you mean, Gary. Nobody thought of training dogs to lead blind people in those days. We hold on to a rope so that we don't get lost or separated from one another. But come on in. You must meet my friends. What big books, Grandad! Yes, that's the way the blind used to have to read. The way Louis himself learned. What a huge book. It's very heavy, too. And it takes ages to read. Because you have to go right round the letter before you even know what it is. Do you want to have a go? All right. You'll have to close your eyes, Gary. All right. <laughs> is it a V? Well done. But it is difficult. Mm. I'll tell you why that is. That's because letters were invented for eyes, not fingers. Come over here and see what Louis has worked out. Thank you. Dots. Just like Auntie Pat was touching on the menu. What gave you the idea of using dots, Louis? Well, it was when a soldier came to give a talk to us. He had worked out a code using raised dots mm. so that soldiers could read messages in the dark without lighting a candle. But his code was only good for saying simple things. And there were too many dots. Louis' alphabet is much simpler, and there are never more than six dots for each letter. Here they come, here they come. Who? Oh. It's Dr. Pinier, the new head of the school, and two school governors. The governors are the people who decide how the school is going to be run. So, you see, we've come on a very important day, because if the governors like Louis Dots, they can tell all the teachers that from now on, all the blind children can learn to read and write with them. Boys. You may sit. Dr. Pinier. He's a very kind man. But how do you know him if you can't see him? I can recognize him by his voice. Gentlemen, the boy I told you about, Louis Braille. And this is the new alphabet he has invented for the blind. You see how neat and small the groups of dots are. Tell them why, Louis. It's so that each letter can be read with one touch of a fingertip. One of the most useful things about Braille's system is that it makes it easy for the blind to write as well as read. Louis, show the governors your planchette. And where did you get this? 
Dr. Pinier kindly allowed Gabriel and me to make it in the workshop. I see. If you would like to dictate something to me, sir, Gabriel will go out of the room while I write it down. As you wish. Out you go, Gabriel. Now, sir, Louis is ready. He will write down anything you want. Um, thanks to the governors. Then Louis started writing in Braille. It's funny. He seemed to be writing the wrong way round. He started on the right. Begging on the streets. That will do, I think. Hippolyte, you can tell Gabriel to come in now. Then we saw why Louis was writing the wrong way round. He was making the bumps on the other side of the paper. And this spells out what I just said, does it? Yes, sir. You saw how quickly he wrote it. No. Gabriel, would you read what is written on the paper? Thanks to the governors of this school, many blind children are saved from a life of begging on the streets. No blind person can read as fast as that. He must have been listening outside the door. Well, sir? Uh, very interesting. But now we must be getting along. Thank you, young man. Good afternoon, boys. Good afternoon, Good afternoon sir. sir. Well, adopt your system now, Louis. You'll see. But if we were to change to his method, it would mean new books. Well, of course, yes. But, my dear doctor, we can't just scrap the ones we already have. Think what they cost. And another thing, it would mean the boys could write notes to each other which their teachers couldn't read. I think their teachers will have to learn to read and write with this new alphabet, sir. Learn to read a new alphabet in order to teach the blind? Ridiculous. They'd never agree. No, 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 no. We'll keep things as they are. Braille's a bright boy, but he's only a boy. He's much too young to know what's best. The magic was wearing off, so we said goodbye to Louie and went back home. Look how fast Auntie Pat's hand is moving. And her book's written in Braille. So that must mean they did start using his alphabet, in spite of that horrible man. Yes, they did. But not for many years. Not till after Louis was dead. So Louis never knew? No. That's sad. We should have told him. <laughs> Louis Braille, Louis Braille, blind at three, blind at three. Worked out a new way for the blind to read from small raised dots, small raised dots. I accident the other day, I had to be taken to hospital in an ambulance. Hello, young man. Oh, you look as if you've been in the wars. He got knocked off his bike. Oh, dear. Nasty. He's lucky it could have been very much worse. Can you do something for me? Can you slip this under your arm? I just want to take your temperature. Why has he got to have his temperature taken? To make sure he hasn't got a fever. Because if he's got a fever, it means there's infection. An infection means that there are germs living somewhere in the body. Usually in the part that's been hurt. And they can make you very ill. And they like dirty places. That's why we keep hospitals so clean. Well, this boy hasn't got any infection. No Does that mean I can go home? No. Doctor says you've got to stay in overnight, so we can make sure your head's all right. I don't want to stay in night. I wish I was staying. I like hospitals. I'm going to be a nurse when I grow up. Are you? That's nice. That is nice, Kimberly. 
Nurses do a very useful job. But you know, girls weren't always allowed to be nurses. There was a time when your mum and dad would have done anything to stop you being a nurse. Why? Because hospitals weren't always like this. They were horrible, dirty places. Nobody went anywhere near a hospital if they could help it. What happened if they were ill? They were looked after at home. You see, people didn't like ladies that they didn't know looking after men or even little boys when they were ill. They thought it was rude. Did they? Oh. Wish we could see an old hospital. Well, doubtless that could be arranged. But I don't think you'd like it. I would, I would. I'd like it better here. Where are we going to go to, Grandad? How many years ago? We're going to go back 140 years to meet a very special lady who wanted to be a nurse so badly that her parents finally let her. What was her name? Her name was Florence Nightingale. But she was known as the Lady with the Lamp. Why? Just you wait and see. But Florence Nightingale was an English lady, but we're not going to meet her in England. We're going to a place called Scutari, thousands of miles away, at a time when there was a war on. A real war? A real war. Now, we're going to a hospital where the British soldiers were brought when they were injured. And I tell you, Gary, when you've seen this, You'd be glad to come back here and spend the night in this ward here. What song are we going to sing, Grandad? I'm going to sing a song that everybody was singing then when they said goodbye to their families and went off to the war. So, close your eyes and wish hard. Farewell, England, much as we may love thee, we'll dry the tears which we have shed before. Why should we weep and sail in search of fortune? So farewell, England, farewell forever. This is awful. It can't be a hospital. <laughs> it is. It smells more like a toilet. That's because there aren't enough people to clean the toilets and empty the chamber pots. <gasps> Look, there's rats! I told you it would be terrible. It's filthy. There must be lots of germs here. There are. Most of the soldiers don't die from their wounds. They die from illness and infection. And half these poor people haven't even got beds. Grandad, look! There's a boy here. I think the children went to war. Well, not many did. But there were a few boys in the army as drummer boys. They played the drums for the men to march to. But when there was a battle, they had to take messages from one part of the battleground to the other. And unless I'm very much mistaken, this is William McElwa. Billy, sir. My mates call me Billy. What happened to him? Can you talk to us, Billy? Tell us what happened. I don't really remember. All I know is I was running through a lot of smoke. Next thing I knew, they was carrying me here. And I'd lost my leg. Lost your leg? A cannonball shattered it. I had to saw it off above the knee. Did it hurt? What do you think? William? Oh, miss. Hello, miss. Miss Nightingale, how do you do? It's an honour to meet you. Children, this is Miss Florence Nightingale. How do you do? Excuse me. Miss Nightingale's just arrived from England with her nurses. She hasn't had time to do much yet. How are you feeling today, William? Not good, miss. I feel all dizzy. 
And Miss Stump's all hot and throbbing. What's he mean, his stump, Grandad? His stump's the part of his leg that's left after they've cut off the bad bit. You have a fever, William. That means his wound's infected. How long is it since you had your bandages changed? They ain't changed them since they brought me here, miss. I'll see if I can find someone to help you, William. <laughs> but why doesn't she do it herself? I thought she was a nurse. She can't do it herself. The doctors have told us she mustn't. She's fine. They'll put her outside the hospital altogether. She doesn't do as she's told. Try and drink some of the soup, William. It will build up your strength. That's good, miss. I can't eat this other stuff they give me. Do you want it? What is it? I don't know. Bald might not expect. <coughs> but it usually is. No, thanks. It looks horrible, Grandad. Well, you see, until Miss Nightingale arrived, no one thought of cooking special food for people who weren't feeling well. Miss Nightingale, may I have a word with you, please? I certainly, Dr. Mingis. Take your time with the soup, William. I'll be back to see you later. We'll listen to this. I hope you feel better soon, Billy. But if his wound's infected in a filthy place like this, only a miracle can save him. Madam, I thought I had made it clear to you that I do not want ladies in the wards. But I was not nursing or bandaging, sir. I was merely giving the men some soup. I think you do not understand me, Miss Nightingale. I do not want ladies in the wards. As you wish, sir. Wards such as these are not the place for ladies like you. Sir, before you leave, there is something else. Yes? The men have no clothes, sir. No toothbrushes, no combs, no knives, no forks. <laughs> there are no bandages, no crutches. There is not even soap to wash the sheets. Oh, don't you worry your head about that, Miss Nightingale. Everything is being taken care of. <sighs> but everything is not being taken care of. That is exactly the point. You see how difficult it is, but we'll see. We'll see. One day these silly men will realize how much we can help them. One day, God willing, my nurses will not just make soup and scrub floors. One day they will dress wounds and put splints on broken limbs. One day this hospital will be a place fit for brave men. things get better, Grandad? Yes, they did. Because soon afterwards, there was another big battle, which meant lots more wounded soldiers. So, the doctors had to ask Miss Nightingale to help them. And she did. Would you like to see how much better this hospital was by the end of the war? What, more magic? Why not? <laughs> so come close and close your eyes. Farewells to tarry, horrible and dirty. Farewell to rats and beds of dirty hay. Let's see the change when Nightingale got working. Let's see what happened when Florence got her way. The smell's gone. This can't be the same place. It is the same place, but it's been cleaned and painted. And they've all got beds. And mattresses. <laughs> and clean sheets. Did Florence Nightingale do this? Well, not on her own. She got other people to scrub the floors and paint the walls. But she was the person that made it happen. How did she do it? She wrote lots and lots of letters to people back home telling them how awful it was. Getting them to change the rules. Hello. You was the ones come to see me when I was so ill. It's Billy. You see, he pulled through. Oh, I pulled through all right, thanks to the bird. Thanks to who? Miss Nightingale, of course. Why do you call her the bird? Because Nightingale, bird. Nightingale's a bird, innit? Thank you, Miss Shaw. 
Oh, well, blimey, here she comes. If you could ask Better get into bed. She don't lock people out of bed. Don't miss Nightingale. The lady with the lamp. Now you see why they called her that. She used to pass each bed in the hospital every single night. Sometimes as late as two or three o'clock in the morning. Are you comfortable, William? Yes, miss. Thank you, miss. You see, he's kissing her shadow. She saved his life, you see. God bless you, ma'am. Bless you, ma'am. Gary was all right, so the doctor said he could go home the next day. On our way to the bus, Grandad took us to see a statue of Florence Nightingale, just outside the hospital. Well, there she is, the lady with the lamp. She looks just like the lady we saw. Yeah, but the lamp's wrong. She's got the wrong sort of lamp. Well spotted, Gary. Now, why do you think that is? Was it because the person who made the statue didn't know what sort of lamp she had, so they just guessed? Exactly. That's what happens when it comes to history. People don't work hard enough to find out exactly what things were like. They don't ask enough questions. Well, home we go. Cheer, boys, cheer, a most determined lady. Cheer, girls, cheer, for Florence Nightingale. She led the way for women to be nurses. All thanks to her, we've cleaned hospitals today. in our street the other day. That night it was on the news. That's our street! Look, Grandad, that's our street! It's a good job all the houses next door to it didn't catch fire as well. Yeah, because if they did, it might have burned our house down. Don't be stupid, Gary. It wouldn't burn down all the houses in the street. It might, it might, it, Grandad. Well, that doesn't happen very often these days, thank goodness. Got such big fire engines and lots of water to put the fire out. But uh, he wasn't always like that. Today you just dial 999 and the fire engine comes as quickly as it can. Oh, Gary! But in days gone by there was no fire service. And there were a lot more fires because the houses were built of wood. And when a lit candle fell over, psst, the house went up in flames in no time at all. What did people do? They did their best with buckets of water, but it didn't always work. In fact, a very long time ago, in the summer when it was very dry and hot, a fire broke out in London that lasted for four days and nights. And nobody could put it out. It burnt down churches, shops, houses, the whole city of London. The whole city? Well, almost all. It started in a baker's shop one night when everyone was asleep. But how do you know? I know because there was a man alive at the time who kept a diary. That's what we do at school, when the teacher asks us to write down our news. And that's exactly what this man did. His name was Samuel Pepys, and he lived about 300 years ago. Would you like me to take you back in time and meet him? Yes! Yes, please! <laughs> well, we said fire as well! Yes, you will. Which means you've both got to be very good because fires are dangerous things. We'll be good, Grandad, we promise. Gary? Yeah, honest. All right, close your eyes, wish hard, while I sing us back into the past. London's burning, London's burning, fetch buckets, fetch buckets, fire 
That's him. And look, he's actually writing his diary. Why is he writing with a feather? Because everyone did in those days. No biros, no lead pencils. They just sharpened quill feathers and dipped them in the ink. Well, I see that you've arrived. Yes, Mr. Pepys. And very glad we are to be here. The children were wondering if you could tell us about the fire of London. Why, all they need to do is go outside. There's a very big fire raging now. What? You mean there's a fire outside now? This minute? Yes. And likely to spread with no rain and these high winds blowing the sparks everywhere. Excuse me. I've just been to see the king today to tell him how bad things are. I must just write down what he said. What did he say? Why, he agreed with my plan. To blow up houses in the path of the fire so the fire has nothing to burn. He told me to tell the mayor to do it at once. So naturally, I did. Does that mean anyone can go and see the king, Granddad? <laughs> no, no, no. Mr. Pepys is a very important person. He works for the king, King Charles II. And the king knows him quite well. I can't read his writing, Granddad. <laughs> That's because you're not meant to, young lady. What's he mean, Grandad? He means his diary is secret. He wrote in special writing so that no one could understand it easily. He's got very posh clothes. Oh, yes. He's very keen on his clothes. Spent a lot of money on them. And why's he got long hair? Why? Is the fashion. All fine gentlemen dress as I do. You don't like it? Um, not much. I'll have you know this is my best periwig. It cost me a great deal of money. If he says it's a wig. Wig. <laughs> sir, Mr. Pepys, sir. You did not knock, Jane. How many times have I told you to knock? I'm sorry, sir, but the wind's changed direction, sir. The fire, the wind is blowing the fire this way. Right, no time to waste. We must pack up the house. We must cut everything into carts. But there's not a cart to be had, sir. Nonsense. There's always a cart to be had if you pay enough money. These books here, these must be saved. Get the paintings down, pack up the bedclothes. Not you. You can come into the garden and help my servant boy dig a pit. Come, come, follow. What's the whole for, Grandad? Well... Burying things is a very good way of stopping them from getting burnt. I suppose he's going to bury something very important here. I expect it's money or jewels. We should just have to see. Wine's to go in the pit, Tom. Yes, ma'am. Have you brought that cheese out, Jane? Oh, not yet, sir. I've been loading the bedclothes on the cart, sir. Go and get it quick. Important papers. Oh. Does he mean his diary? Maybe. It might mean something to do with his work. The cheese, sir. Oh, my parmesan. I wrapped it in canvas, sir. Hope that keeps the worms from it. <sighs> Why is he so worried about a bit of cheese when he thinks his house is going to burn down? Well, Mr. Pepys is very fond of his food. And this is a very special cheese, parmesan, from Italy. It costs a lot of money. Even so. My dear young woman, there is nothing I can do to save my house. But I can save my papers, my wine and my cheese. One day this fire will be over. It will be history. And when it is, I will be very pleased to come back here and dig them up. Grandad, hmm? I think Gary's gone off on his own. Well, he hasn't, has he? 
Oh, well, that's done it. What shall I tell you, Mum, if we have to go back to the present without him? I don't suppose he's gone far. My cloak, Jane! Come, let's go look for him. It was a bit scary to leave Seething Rain, but we had to look for Gary. getting really worried, and so was I. Mr. Peeps took us back to his house, just in case Gary had gone back there. It's not dead off its heart beating. Gary! Gary, where have you got to? The fright you gave us all. Where have you been? I went out to look at the fire with Tom. You should have had more sense taking a child into danger. And what about my books? You're trying to tell me you finished packing. You are a lazy young scoundrel. None of my sight. What's the case, fault? He came with me to rescue this bird. It's a pigeon. Yes, there are many such. They stay too long in the burning buildings, and then their feathers are singed, and they cannot fly. Poor pigeon. Poor people. It's not only birds that are dying in this fire. It's not dead. No, but it soon will be. It cannot fly. Why don't you build a nest for it in that corner, Gary? Hmm? But a cat might get it there. The cats have long since run away. Well, we can't take it into the present. But I don't want to leave it. Here, young master, I'll take care of it. You'd best be going. It's this is a safe place for any of us. She's right, you know. Take my hands <laughs> and pray that the poor people survive this terrible fire. Come along. Goodbye, Mr. Peeps. Bye, Jane. Bye, Tom. A person did find out about Mr. Peeps' funny writing, so Grandad could read us bits from a copy of Mr. Peeps' secret diary. So he really did go and talk to the king, and he really did go back after his house had burned down and dig up his trays. Oh, I don't know about that, but his house wasn't burned down. No, no, the fire stopped at the end of the street. But of course, Mr. Peeps didn't know that was going to happen. No. He left Seething Lane and spent the last night of the fire at his friend's house. And poor old Mr Peeps, who hadn't even got a nightshirt, had to spend the night in his drawers. His drawers? His underpants. I wish I could see that. Uh, well, that might be managed. Just for a minute. In seething rain, Grandad took us back to the same spot where Mr. Peep's house used to be, where we helped him bury his cheese. Here we are. This is the place. It doesn't look like the same place at all. No, it doesn't. But that's because things change all the time. After London was burnt down, it was rebuilt, of course, and it's been rebuilt quite a few times since. These buildings are quite modern here now. One day they'll be old, though. That's right, they will. And we'll be history. And people will wonder what life was like for us. I wonder where we dug the hole. It's hard to say, it's all so different. I still think it was a funny thing to do, to save the cheese. Well, everyone thinks different things are important, I suppose. What would you try to save if you thought your house was going to burn down? 
I don't know. I have to think about that. Samuel Pepys, Samuel Pepys, saw the great fire of London, wrote it down, wrote it down.